Happy New Year and welcome to the first Plimpton podcast of 2017. This month, as well as looking back at some of the events and happenings in Plimpton during the year just ended, we meet up with Plimpton Cubs and we also find out, among other things, about the work of Devon Free Wheelers. The Plimpton Podcast! But first, Beacon Medical Group at Plimpton are about to launch a course for patients with long-term conditions. Just before Christmas, I called into their Mudgeway practice to find out more about it from Paula varndall Dawes. Yeah, so the course that we're running at Beacon is for patients that uh, reside around the Plimpton area, but it's being run by the Plymouth Guild, and it's to support patients with a long-term condition, and that can be absolutely any long-term condition at all, but it's to promote a better quality of life and to improve patients' um, ability to manage their condition, make them feel more empowered, and actually get a bit more out of their interactions with their doctors and their healthcare professionals. Now, if they've got sort of different uh, conditions, how is that going to, to work in practice? Uh, so this course is, is quite generic in style. It's about managing the way you live with, with whatever long-term condition you have. So it's not specific to diabetes or COPD, so don't think that you have to come along with anything very specific. This is about getting more out of your life and, and empowering um, patients and people that live with a long-term condition to get the most effective treatment, to understand how their treatment works perhaps a little better, to have um, uh, the understanding of uh, healthy eating options and taking exercise but also which is really important that's mixing with people that also have a long-term condition so that you can perhaps buddy up and talk to people who are you know in the same or very similar situation to yourselves and just improve your whole quality of life. And uh, over what period of time are these courses uh, being run? So our first course starts on the 26th of January and it's being run by a fantastic lady called Jan White who works for the, the Plymouth Guild and the course will run for a couple of hours each week so starting on the 26th right the way through to the 2nd of March. Can people sort of join mid, uh, mid-course if they miss the, the first one or two of the course? Yeah, so obviously the best thing that, uh, the best thing to get out of the course is to be there for, from the beginning to the end. But we understand that living with a long-term condition can sometimes be obviously very difficult. So if you come along to the first one and, and have to miss a couple, or, like, or also if you come to the second one and, and you know, commit as much as you can, then that's, that's great. But it's six weeks, but obviously the course, right, the course facilitator is very flexible. Uh, and in terms of the people actually running the course, what's their background experience? So that's really, that's a very interesting question. So the Plymouth Guild is um, long-term condition self-management course. is run by people who live with a long-term condition. So these people have been there and done that, and they've come out the other end. And this is a, as a, as a, 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 as a certified course which is recognised and, and it's, it's full of really insightful and helpful information as I say as well as being with people that are also living with a a similar long-term condition. So what has brought this project about? We want patients to get the most out of their healthcare professionals and their interactions but more importantly we know that the health service needs um, some some give. We need we understand that you know we've got to a point now where this the system is very pressurized and we need patients to take ownership of their health. So uh, it's all about working together with your healthcare professional to maximize that interaction to get the best out of it so that you don't have to can you know come up to the GP all the time perhaps you get some tips and hints about how to manage yourself a bit better and be a bit more proactive in the way you you look after yourself and uh, I suppose uh, mental health and mindset is is also part and parcel of it isn't it absolutely this is all about taking ownership and and being a bit more proactive and you know maybe it could be this could be uh, you, you sit in there and perhaps you've got you've had a um, um, a low-grade um, mental illness like a depression or something like that and you're thinking this course isn't for me absolutely Absolutely not. It is. It is. It's, it's, it's um, definitely pointed at people with all sorts of, of long-term conditions that they live with. So, if you're feeling isolated and you're perhaps a little bit down and depressed, this course is absolutely perfect for you as well. And I'll be speaking more with Paula later on in this podcast. Plimpton Cubs had a special centenary event one evening last month to mark 100 years of the Cub Scout movement. As they gathered at the top of Plimpton Castle, they broke out into an appropriate song for the location. Oh, the grand old Duke of York, he has 10,000 men. He marched them up to the top of the hill when he marched them down again. And when they were up, they were up. And when they were down, they were down. And when they were only halfway up, they were now up the time. 
Australia. Come on, and do a bit quicker. Here we go. Pass the screen. One, two, three. Oh, the grand old Duke of York. He has 10,000 men. He marched them up to the top of the hill when he marched them down again. And when they were up, they were up. And when they were down, they were down. And when they were only halfway up, they were neither up nor down. Parents aren't joining in. No. No. <laughs> the grand old Duke of York. He has 10,000 men. He marched them up to the top of the hill and he marched them down again. And when they were up, they were up. And when they were down, they were down. And when they were only halfway up, they were neither up nor down. Yeah, no Duke of York, he has 10,000 men. He marched them up to the top of the hill and he marched them down again. And when they were up, they were up. And when they were down, they were down. And when they were only halfway up, they were neither up nor down. Well, we did it once more, this time. When we set up, we're going to go down. Down, you up. So they almost turn the torches off so they don't see me make a mistake. Brilliant. So, after three, one, two, three. Oh, oh the grand old chief of your, he had 10,000 men. He marched him up to the top of the hill and he marched them down again. And when they were up, they were up. And when they were down, they were down. And when they were only halfway up, they were not there. Thank you. And a little later on, we'll be hearing the Cubs renewing their promise. There's growing concern among the medical profession that the more we use antibiotics, the less effective they become. Plimpton GP Dr David Gwynne explained the situation to me. Uh, in the news, Lord O'Neill was talking about um, antibiotic resistance, and we are uh, struggling uh, to have or find new antibiotics to, uh, uh, to work uh, on an increasing level, and we're seeing that even at our level in primary care. Um, so it's important that we keep these antibiotics for when people really need them uh, for the bacterial infections they, they, they have. So in order to try and avoid use of antibiotics, it would be great if we could stop people getting to the point where they get there. And, and often, if you have bronchitis, for example, or poorly managed asthma, it does make you more, more vulnerable to getting a, a bacterial infection. And if we can manage that asthma better, we might m- mean that you don't need to, to go down the line to needing these antibiotics. Mm. Uh, and you were mentioning there, if people rely too much uh, on antibiotics, it will get to the stage uh, uh, where it's not possible to perform things like uh, appendix operations and hip replacements. Why is that? In, in medicine at the minute, there's a lot of uh, energy and, 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 and discussion around this topic. What we're worried about is a post-antibiotic era where we get to the point where the uh, bacteria have developed a knowledge of the antibiotics, as it were, or resistance, as we call it, so that the antibiotics don't work anymore against those bugs. And if that's the case, you could example, if, if, if you have a hip operation today, not only will you have the operation, but you will be given a course of antibiotics to stop that getting infected. The trouble with that, if you do get a hip replacement getting infected, it can be very, very severe and may even need the metal work taken out again. And in extreme examples, you're talking about uh, amputations. So 
there is no surgeon on the planet who will operate on you for a hip replacement if he hasn't got antibiotics to supplement that. So mm. if we're in an era where most bacteria are resistant to antibiotics, we're in big trouble. And the same happens with appendicitis, even small ear perforation operations. It's a big deal, and we need to be taking it far more seriously. And the medical profession is, is really getting increasingly worried about this. Mm. Uh, and the sort of fact people generally, regardless whether they themselves had uh, had a preponderance of well, antibiotics in the past. Well, this is exactly the case. I mean, you know, take small water infections, cystitis, for example. We treat that with an antibiotic for a few days, but we're seeing more and more and more that a lot of these urinary tract infections are resistant to the antibiotics that we used to give them even five years ago, and now we're having to use stronger antibiotics to treat the same things. And this is happening on the ground right now, day to day, all across the UK, and that trend is increasing. So we need to make sure that we are protecting these antibiotics and using them when we really need them. So increasingly, uh, we're challenging situations where, where some people might be expecting to receive antibiotics when actually these things might well be viral and we We'd be looking for a bit more evidence before we'd be using the antibiotic. I think yeah, that's probably going to be a sort of a, a mindset problem for, for patients, isn't it? They've been so used to coming and sort of getting their prescription for antibiotics, suddenly to find, well, no, I'm not going to do that on this occasion, Mr. and Mrs. Jones. Uh, and, yeah, and, you, and you've hit this on the head. It's, it's, it's a society issue, actually. We all, unfortunately, have developed this belief that um, uh, antibiotics cure uh, coughs and colds, and, and, and they, they don't. All they do is kill bacteria. Uh, the body does the rest of it. But today, the research has come out to suggest that almost two-thirds of antibiotics prescriptions are actually unnecessary uh, and that given time the body would sort it out themselves mm. programs just for you the Clinton podcast devon free wheelers have been the adopted cause of a number of local organizations in recent years plimpton gardeners association raised money for them in 2015 and they are currently the brook inn's adopted calls some of their vehicles were displayed at the 2016 cormage show during which there was a short address about their work we have the Devon Free Wheelers Riding for Life Emergency Response Volunteers the Transport Team, and it's my pleasure to introduce to you Colin Hunt, who's going to tell us a little bit more about what they do. Colin. That's better. It helps enormously if you switch the microphone on. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as I John said, my name is Colin, and I'm a volunteer with uh, Devon Free Wheelers. I don't know if, uh, if you've heard of us before, but we are a group of volunteers, free wheelers. Uh, we're generally bikers, and we work in coordination with the NHS and other medical establishments, but we are not actually part of the NHS. We're not, we're not employed by the NHS, we're not funded or receive any funding from the NHS and the government at all. Um, we're all a group of volunteers. Uh, first of all, in the first bike there we have Neil, then we have Peter, and then we have Jill with her assistants in the back there in the Range Rover. And the main purpose of Devon um, Free Wheelers, we were actually formed in 2009 as a volunteer group to move urgent blood stocks between NHS establishments. Um, We work out of hours from 6 o'clock at night till 7 in the morning, uh, bank holidays 24-7 and weekends 24-7. And we are on call to the NHS to assist with the transportation of urgent blood, urgent drugs. Also we move tissue samples for testing and also we work with transplant teams as well to make sure that the tissue gets to the correct place for testing. Now, we're all volunteers, and our guys have a normal daytime job, and they will, of course, uh, finish their daytime job, then go on standby, ready to be called out at any time. The old Plimpton Grammar School in George Lane was open to the public during last May's Plimpton Local History Week. I popped along and admired the internal architecture with local historian Sally Luscombe, who told me more about it. It's lovely, isn't it? The architect, he lived at what's now called Ford Benz. John Avon, and he apparently designed it all himself. He was a builder, and when he reached the door level, that was when he put the date on, rather than when the building was founded. So it says 1664, but that's not when the school opened or when the school foundations were laid, but when he reached that height. Right, OK. So when, when was this actually uh, formed as a school? It opened its doors in 1672. Elias Heal they provided the money. He died in 1635, but then his relations contested the will because he had 
properties, 70 properties throughout the South Hams. But his cousins, they said the family money, they should have some of it as well. So we all went through. And it wasn't until 1658 things were actually settled. And John Maynard, his brother in law, was able to get on with the foundations and. And things have become full circle, really, because this started off taking Elias Heel's name with the school, then it became Plimpton Grammar, and now you have Heels uh, again, albeit on a different site. Seymour Road. Yeah. Yes. But the last time this was used as a school was for the children that came from Lambs Park in the 1980s. OK. And so what is the building used for today, then? At the moment, the residents from the house across the way, at right, close reach, they're using it, well, for their exercises and whatever... Mm-hmm. But now that Close Reach owns it, there's plans to open it up as a community building again. And, and to, to, uh, for the couple of days here for the Plimpton uh, Local History Week, it has been open to members of the public to come in and have a look around. Yes, and they have told me that, and perhaps the wider public would like to know, that if in future I ask, I can bring people in. Right, okay. Providing they're not mm. using it, obviously. Yeah. But. Uh, and what sort of feedback have you had from the people who've come in thus far? We have met... Not a direct descendant from Eli's Hill, but a sideways step. Eli's Hill's grandparents and her, no, great, 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 great grandparents on the same level then. That's where she was related. So somebody about now who's related to the Hill family. Okay. And there's a, sort of another building in the grounds. Was that part of the school as well? That was built for the headmasters, a huge residence. For, <laughs> but maybe they thought all the headmasters would have big families. But before that was built, you know, the Reynolds, they moved into the house that was just southwest of this building, but, and that was pulled down earlier in, in the 19th century. And when you think that the building the size that it is uh, t- here today, you, you know, provided uh, grammar school education for, for you know, most of uh, Plimpton, it, it really does indicate how Plimpton has expanded when you think about the, now the size of the modern heel school over at Seymour Road. Yes, but this was built for the poor children from Plimpton St Mary, Plimpton St Morris and Brixton. So the ones from Brixton had to come over the hill in a horse and cart. (laughs) But there wasn't enough money to keep it going, so the more wealthy people were encouraged to send their children here as well. So the Edgecombe family, they had children here. Trebis came here. And it reads as though the Edgecombes boarded in Plimpton House with the Treby family. And uh, the room we're in at the moment, which you know, re- resembles a great big hall, are there more um, you know, rooms to this uh, building than the one we're in at the moment? There's the downstairs rooms, which are just sort of bare rooms, with a little extension with toilets and whatever. A tiny room, which is, uh, serves as a kitchen. And then upstairs, there's like a study room. And although you can't get onto it, there's a door onto the balcony where the headmaster used to stand. And he taught in the early days things like Latin and Greek. So would would all different ages of children be taught in the same room then at the same same time? Mm. Yes. There's a picture here with desks in it. You can see if I can explain that the desks were in like groups of four. There's no heating in the room at all. Somebody gave them a barometer at one time. That is a picture of Reynolds. Not the one we've got now. And underneath it was a plaque, which was always surrounded by a wreath. So how many pupils would fit in here, roughly? In the old books, I've got about 16 at one time. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. This funny thing here, to me, that looks like toilet facilities. <laughs> do you see what I mean? It's yes, got I like do. a little yeah. lid yeah. and whatever. <laughs> but what is it then, do we know? I really don't know, but... <laughs> it does look a bit they, like that. They it? had to have them, didn't they? Well, yes, I suppose so. Yeah. yeah. Maybe there was a screen nap normally, but for the sake of the photo, they took it down. Yeah. Here in an ancient sunnery town, the Plimpton Podcast. Back now to my discussion with Paula Varndell Dawes, as she tells me more about the course for people with long term conditions that Beacon Medical are setting up. So, we'd like to run this course with at least 14 people if we can. Um, but in, and, and obviously, if we get over oversubscribed, then that's even better um, because we can run courses continually then. But if you're interested in, in coming along to the course, then just contact um, Beacon Medical Practice and we'll, we will sign you up for it. Um, you can contact us at Mudgeway 
and and that's absolutely fine. Yeah. So is is it definite that there's going to be follow on courses uh, after the initial six weeks? Well, obviously, we need people people to sign up to this. Um, we need people to understand this is going to really improve their health and well being. Um, and if we get a, a full course, then we will continually run the course with the Plymouth Guild. So the idea is absolutely to keep this going. Uh, and is this uh, uh, unique in Plimpton, or is this uh, going on elsewhere in the city? So it's it's going on. Um, you can take part of this through the Plymouth Guild, which is centred in city centre. But this is unique for Plimpton. So we've we've managed to get the Guild to commit to helping us to really empower and um, be a great resource for our patients at the Beacon Medical Practice. Well, that sounds uh, very interesting. So simply come along and uh, either phone or turn up at the uh, practice to, to book yourself onto the course. Is that yeah, what you absolutely. You can contact um, Jam White on 01752 201 892 or you can email um, Jan at uh, the self management at Plymouth Guild dot org dot uk now there may be people who uh, think well i would like to do this but they might perhaps have mobility problems or they live in an area which is not particularly serviced uh, well by public uh, transport and i think there's a sort of time bank uh, linked with this explain that to us yeah so we're really excited we're working with a group of people again from the plymouth guild and dr ed parry jones and we are developing um, something which is really unique for plimpton again but also joining up with pr- um, surgeries in the plymouth in the city center this is a time bank and it's to support people who live with a long-term condition to buddy up and be befriended um, with someone who, again, perhaps has um, insight into um, giving effective information. So this could be a healthcare professional, it could be someone who's an expert person in their their, um, field, maybe living with a long-term condition themselves, but also um, some that's enabling patients to get um, support it could be support to come to the long-term conditions course. It could be just talking to, sitting down and talking to someone in their own home. But if that um, individual is budded up with the right person, then you're banking time. So if if the the individual that's helping the person with the long-term condition um, wants to learn to play the guitar or needs some cookery lessons or anything at all, um, they can bank that time and ask the time bank for some help in 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 response or um, in partnership with with um, get, giving the help in the first instance if that so w- would the body be expected to sit in on the session or, or would they simply bring that person um, to, to the uh, to the class and uh, then sort of collect them again afterwards so that's that's really um, entirely down to the, the relationship that's created between the, the, t- the two individuals so it could be that the the buddy stays at the course and and learns about you know, the, the course themselves or it could be that they just simply brought that person to the, the course and and pick them up again at the end uh, but it's it's a great opportunity to to come together and and to to help and also get something back in return so there is a role then for someone who perhaps doesn't have a long term condition but is interested in this time bank idea to, to get involved yeah absolutely so this is sharing the opportunity to to one learn but two be befriend somebody and three give your expertise as well and in and re, and in um re, you know response to that that you're banking your own time and you can actually pull some resources yourself from from the time bank and and do whatever you need to do. Okay, so those interests are solely in the time banking uh, side of it who aren't people with the long-term condition how do they get involved? What's their mechanism of making contact? So the best way to do that is probably to contact m- me in the first instance because I'm working with Dr. Parry Jones and Liz Packer from the Guild. So you can contact me at paula.vandell-doors at nhs.net um, and, and I'll put you in touch with the right people and we'll get that going. I mean, that, this is a really unique and great opportunity for the people of Plimpton. As we heard earlier, the Plimpton Cubs have been celebrating the centenary of the Cub Scout movement. This involved them renewing their promise in a ceremony at Plimpton Castle. I promise. I promise. That I will do my best. That I will do my best. Do my duty. Do my duty. To God and to the Queen. To God and to the Queen. To help other people. To help other people. And keep the Cub Scout law. And keep the Cub Scout law.
I didn't hear any of the parents. <laughs> it wasn't very loud, cubs. You can do better than that. So we'll start again. And parents, give it a B. Hey! Give it an R. Hey! Give it an A. Hey! Give it a B. Hey! Give it an O. Hey! What have you got? Bravo! Plimpton used to have a workhouse and it was located in Market Road. During the 2016 Local History Week, I met Arnie and he told me about his special interest in it. Oh, yes, if anybody has any photographs of the Plimpton workhouse, um, I assumed that I would be able to find photographs, but I've yet to find one photograph of the workhouse except a very tiny part of the background. Right, of, okay. um, it was off um, Market Road. Right, OK. Just, so, just, uh, just down from St Mary's Church. So what, what sort of engendered your interest uh, in the workhouse? Um, well, originally, um, because I, I did my wife's family tree and discovered that two members of her family had been in workhouses in different places... And if you believe Dickens, you know, once you went in the workhouse, that was the end of the world. And they went on to have good families and good lives. And and I thought, well, obviously, it's not quite that bad. Mm. And so I started researching. And the more I researched, the more interested I became. And uh, um, I think they, you know, instead of being the... Obviously, there were some appalling workhouses around... But um, generally, if the organisation behind it, the guardians and the, the employees, were good, honest people, it, it was a, a, a wonderful service. They were basically the DSS, Job Centre, NHS of the early 19th century. Yeah, yeah. Um, so typically what sort of things would people have to do if they were in the workhouse? Um, well, if you were, uh, depending what, if you were in there because you were ill, it was a hospital. Mm-hmm. And they looked after you. Very rudimentary, you know. I mean, health um, knowledge in those days was pretty rudimentary. Um, but at least you were kept warm and dry and you were looked after. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas otherwise you'd have to pay for all that. Um, if you were there because you were out of work, you were given a roof over your head and three quite substantial, not you know very boring, but substantial meals a day. Um, and you were kept fit and healthy while they tried to find, or while you tried to find a, another job for yourself. So I think you know they they actually did a remarkable job, um, and. It, it was organised by guardians who were all voluntary. They were the great and the good of the local area. Um, but the ratepayers paid for it, and the guardians, being major ratepayers, tried to keep the rates as low as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think they, you know, they actually did a, a, an amazingly efficient job. I mean, it's a bit uh, difficult to comprehend it these days, isn't it, when you've got well, to the well, NHS well, in its current yes. form and the other benefits I mean, that there are now? Yeah, I, I, even things like pensions. You know, there were no pensions until the 1920s, off the top of my head. And prior to that, it's nothing unusual, if you look at the census, to find people described as laundresses or labourers in their 70s because if you didn't work, you starved. Mm-hmm. So you carried on working until you died. So, um, the, the, you know, the alternative was, if you got too old and decrepit to work, then you went in the workhouse. It was considered a, a, a matter of shame to go in the workhouse. It's not something you did voluntarily, but I think, overall, they did a very good job. And if you do have any photos of the workhouse you'd be able to let Ernie have, borrow or copy, then let us know and we'll put you in touch with him. Just for you, the Plimpton Podcast. The theme tune and some backing tracks to items in our podcasts have been provided free of charge by Audio Nautics. For full details of their copyright-free library, visit audionautics.com. Long dark nights and the terrible weather. We don't need to be told it's winter. 
But a gentle reminder never goes amiss about how to stay safe on the roads, whatever the weather throws at us this time of year. Has the car been serviced? And have you thought about keeping some extra warm clothes in it? Is the de-icer handy? And remember, the roads could be slippery, so be prepared and drive carefully. It's easy to remind ourselves about driving safely in all conditions. Just search online for Winter Highways. Andrew Hill. And now for a rundown of some of the main news stories in Plimpton during the past year. Lyndon Holmes were refused permission to build on land opposite Barrington Park Golf Club. They appealed the decision but later withdrew that appeal. Marsh Mills Limited were refused permission to open up an old access to Coy Pool from Woodford Avenue and were forced to block up the opening they had made in anticipation of approval. By contrast, Barrett Homes were given permission to build on land near Redwood Drive. Retailer Next were given permission to build a new store at Marsh Mills and a controversial agricultural building in a field off Ridge Road was given the OK. Childhood councillor Dr David Salter was deselected by the Conservatives when it came to putting up candidates for May's elections. His place was taken by Sam Leaves and Andrea Leverage became a new councillor for the St Mary's Ward. A number of officers at the Plimpton Gardeners Association stood down ahead of the group's AGM. Rose Hamley became chair of the newly formed Plimpton St Mary Neighbourhood Forum and later in the year she also succeeded John Gilding as Stanator of Plimpton. Travellers once again annoyed local residents by setting up camp in the area. An attempted encampment on the cricket field at Harrod Park was quickly thwarted, but in the late summer, travellers did succeed in setting up a temporary home in Plimpton, this time on open grassland in Glen Road by the Westfield Tesco store, but they moved on again shortly afterwards. Local gym owner Steve Swatton continued his fundraising efforts for the Highbury Trust with various initiatives, including a wheelbarrow push around Dartmoor. He also discovered a hidden headstone when he was out and about in local woodland, and this turned out to be related to a relative of Carol Penelurek. The Reverend Robert Harris joined the new team ministry setup covering Plimpton St Mary's and Plimpton St Morris churches, taking on the role of team rector, and the Reverend Roger Beck was formally invested as team vicar. A new sixth form block was opened at Heal School. Ridgeway School opened a new community sports facility, and later in the year the school was renamed Plimpton Academy. B&Q announced they would be closing their Koi Pool store from the 7th of January 2017. B&M's opened up nearby, and in November, Plimpton's much-awaited new Little store opened. Also in 2016, Plimpton's oldest resident, Bluebell Wooland, passed away at the grand old age of 107. A few months before her passing, I called in to see her at Ashley Manor Care Centre, and she told me a bit about her life. I was christened in St Simon's Church, Bogle. I was confirmed and married. But having said that, it's the youngsters together. Anyone living together and they're happy, I say, well done, carry on. I had the most wonderful husband. I got a friend who comes in here. She's living with her boyfriend, but she's happy. So I'm not judging them. For a while, you lived at Billicombe, didn't you? Billicombe? Yeah. Yeah, well, do you know Green Acres? I've heard of it. I'm not quite sure yeah. where it is. Do you is. know the main room? Mm-hmm. Do you remember there was Mumford's Garage on the corner? Well, we had a house built up there, up on the hill. And I, I said to Percy, ask your mum. I don't want her. I'm honest. I wouldn't tell you lots of things that happened. And I went out and they took her out. And she had a look. She said, I'm not living here. She said, yeah, beautiful great people field at the back and just over the hedge was the children Plimstock children's playground All right, mm-hmm. and I could go to the bottom of the garden and see those I love children see them playing and anyway she went out she said how am I going to get out there she's on the bus anyway that's my take and I'm, and I'm so grateful to you you for coming in to see me. That's all right. I like hearing what you've got to say. Well, look, I had a good education. I had wonderful friends. Do you know Tavistock Road? Mm-hmm. I went to the technical school. Do you know the tech, the big, you may not, not I remember. I don't particularly big picture where that is. School. And I had lovely teachers. My mum, Granny Vaughan, and then I had my mum, my granny, great granny and great great, all living together, all living at the same time. Mm. And one lived at Ilfracoon. She was a little lady. She was, she was beautiful. 
She plodded on, and they worked hard in those days. Do you remember Percy Arnold? No. No. No, who's Percy well, Arnold? He, he worked in Boots, the te- in the Boots Orchestra. Right. And he ran a dance band night times, and my husband played for his, his dance band. And when we went to South Africa, we took the grand piano, didn't take the organ. Because you could play those, could, you could play the piano, couldn't you? Yes. Yeah. He had a baby grand. His mum gave him his 20, 21st birthday, gave him his piano, baby grand. And his uncle gave him later, much later, Hammond organ. He played clarinet, saxophone and trombone. He was very musical. I'm very caring. Somebody else who passed away during 2016 was the broadcaster Tony Beard. Some years ago, at an event organised by the Plimpton Fuchsia Group, a ditty he told about satnavs drew a chorus of laughs. I have a little satnav. It sits there in my car. A satnav is a driver's friend. It tells you where you are. I have a little satnav. I've had it all my life. It's better than the normal ones. My sat nav is my wife. <laughs> it gives me full instructions, especially how to drive. It's 30 miles an hour, it says. You're doing 35. It tells me when to stop and start and when to use the brake. It tells me when it's never safe uh, for me to overtake. It tells me when the light is red and when it goes to green. It seems to know instinctively just when to intervene. It lists the vehicles just in front, and they that's at the rear. And taking this into account, it specifies me gear. I'm sure no other driver is so helpful a device, for when we leave and lock the car, it still gives its advice. It fills me up with counselling as each journey pretty fraught. So why don't I extend it and get a quieter sort? Ah, well, you see, it cleans the house. It makes sure I'm properly fed. It washes all my shirts and things and keeps me warm in bed. (laughs) Despite all these advantages and my tendency to scoff, I wish that just once in a while I could turn the damn thing (laughs) off. Something else we learned about last year was the Plymouth Dog Training Club, which meets regularly at Cottle's Lodge. Grooming um, with obedience competitions doesn't come into it at all. So if you wanted to go into the ring with a dog that's just been rolling in a muddy puddle, it wouldn't make any difference. It's the position relative Mm -hmm. to the handler that people are are judging. Um, They haven't got to look pretty, and it can be any breed Okay, and so when is it you meet here at uh, Cottle's Lodge for the Plimpton um, meetings? At, uh, the Plimpton meetings are Tuesday evenings, and we start at half past seven in the evening. Okay, and this is weekly. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which, and, and when do you hold your egg Buckland one? Um, that's on a Wednesday evening, and we start there um, at half past six, and we do a very little puppy training and sort of socialisation type class for puppies from ten weeks old that have had their first lot of injections so that they start off on the right track and get to meet all sorts of other puppies of different shapes and sizes. (laughs) Very, very popular class. So if people wanted to go into the the sort of competition Mm -hmm. um, that you've outlined here today, do they then sort of join the club or do they have to join the club anyway to be part of the the, the training? To be be covered on our insurance. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's the person that joins the club and is covered on the insurance, not the dog. Right. So if you have husband and wife, partners, whatever, that both want to train dogs or that train one dog, then they both have to be members. Although we suggest that only one of them actually does the training on a particular night. Because again, it's trying to avoid confusion for the dog because you'll say sit in a slightly different way to the way I say sit. And if the poor dog's getting both versions within the space of yeah. 10 minutes, it's making it hard for him or her. Yeah, OK. Well, this, uh, this sounds fascinating. If anyone's interested in, uh, in coming down and taking part in the, uh, the dog training at either of the two venues, how do they do that? Just turn up. Uh, they need to bring the dog's vaccination documents with them. 
in, in general, how many people sort of go on to the sort of competition level and oh. to, to what extent do they end up succeeding? We, all, we always say if you get one or two people a year that want to take part in competitions, that's probably all it's going to be. Mm. And how well they succeed depends to a certain degree on how hungry for success they are. Vanessa there telling me about the Plymouth Dog Training Club. In May 2016, there was a battle reenactment at Plimpton Priory. Some bloodthirsty local children seemed to particularly enjoy the event. Go and dispense, sir! That makes your life. No. No? Dispenser! Come on, my legs, make him be strong. Dispenser, go! What are you doing? Dispenser, go on! Come on, Dispenser, go on! Going down! <laughs> Not while my father is king! My lord! You cannot treat your prince this way! You are showing such disrespect to your lord! Shut up, woman! Get back to your place! It's in the kitchen! Oh. Yeah, I agree with that. Hey, hey, <laughs> don't you clap it. Oh, Lord Dispenser. What, my Lord? Not only did you disrespect me on the field of chivalry, you disrespect your lady. My lady, name yourself a champion so we can teach you the lesson. I'll name myself a champion. I will name me. Me. <laughs> I, I will be the champion. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, my lord. You do realise your husband is one of the best fighters in Christendom? Yes, but I'm a woman, my lord. Exactly. Do you think you have what it takes to beat your husband? I have a sharp tongue. <laughs> we all know women can't fight, don't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where do women belong? In the kitchen. In the kitchen. Yeah. Yeah. Good girl. Lady. I would rather be in the kitchen with him than in his bedroom any day, my lord. <laughs> my lady, my prove your work. Are you going to cheer for Lady Dispenser? No, yes! I like this group. <laughs> Are you going to cheer for Lord Dispenser? No. Yes! And who? Lord Dispenser? Yes! Cheer, our lady! Yeah! Or yours? Yeah! <laughs> She's going to whack him with me. <laughs> My lady! Do you not realise those gauntlets make your bum look big? <laughs> well, I want your opinion, my lord. I will give it to you. Hey! Hold your tongue, woman. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you like a small woman? <laughs> right, get on with it. We haven't got all day. Are you ready? Lady! 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 Lady. She's gonna pay. If she does, you'll pay. Later. Come on, my lady. Lady, Yeah, 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 yeah.
to a woman. Hey. 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 <laughs> Do you yield now, my lord? <laughs> Hammerdon Hall is a woodland clump on a hill at the back of Sparkwall, right next to the tungsten tin mine. It forms a distinctive and historic landmark noticeable from most points in Plimpton and beyond. Its future, though, is under threat, as local resident Roger German explained to me. But uh, the thing that my uh, my uh, issue is with Hammerdon Ball and the beach clump, which is on the top of it. Now, traditionally, this has been a romping ground, shall we say, for the young pe- people of Plimpton in their youth, uh, for walking around, having games through the woods and so on and so forth. And if you look up over towards the uh, industrial buildings, you see Hammerton Ball on the right, or more precisely, on the east of, uh, of, 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 of the view. The, so is, is the community still using it uh, for recreational purposes these days? Well, there are footpaths uh, on it and around it, and some of these footpaths are, be- are being lost now. And if you try to uh, redirect or close a footpath in any other circumstances, you probably wouldn't be able to do it. But they have, of course, got permission to do this. Uh, I married a Plimpton girl. She's only moved 500 yards in the whole of her life uh, to, to the house which we've been now in, in now at 52 years. We've got a view in all directions from our windows, but the prominent ones are to the north namely of this this area. Mm -hmm. That's uh, what I was going to say, that her father, my father-in-law, long since deceased, always used to tell about the fun that they had as as youths up in and around Hebridon Ball and Hebridon Clump. So what is your main concern, then? The the loss of the visual appearance of the area or the loss of these footpaths through it? The loss of the visual... The visual uh, uh, point of Hammerton Ball and Hammerton Clump. If you look at it, you see it's a, almost a glowing green hillock with everything industrial around it. And uh, you see the, it, it's a view for a lot over the rooftops, mind you. Okay. But you've got this nice green... Bo- green uh, so at the moment this is screening the, 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 the vision of the, the Drakelands behind it. That's a good it. word, screening. Mm-hmm. It is, is screening a, a lot. A lot. And mitigating is, is a bit my, my yeah. view. Mm-hmm. It mitigates the view. Everything else up there is industrial. But then, as with all things, you know, the, the, there's always you know swings and roundabouts. I suppose the other side of the argument is what well, you know, look at the you know, amount of money that's coming into the economy through what Drake Lens is doing. Well, uh, the the, the uh, Wolf Wolf Minerals are, are, the, are the miners up there from Australia, and they say that uh, when this um, hammer and ball, uh, they will plant some more trees and attempt to, to make it, it as near as possible. But of course, that is how many generations from now before that is ever done. So my, my issue here this evening is that I think Joe Public of Plimpton, I don't think they know that this is in, 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 in the wind, this planning application. Uh, I've been in touch with uh, the Devon County Council. I've made representations against it uh, when I was invited to do so for the pre-submission con- consultation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I've got my representations here. The principal point being about Hammer and Ball. Law firm Nash & Co. held a special fundraising day at the Chadlewood Social Club in 2016. One of the performers at the event was local guitarist and vocalist Tim Lay. Here he is with his self-written track, Whiskey. For your doom, and 
daddy's coming home to tell you your story Now run out to bed now in a war Don't you worry now Now who take care of you for all the years And yeah, we we'll drink our way into the morning light Now don't you worry now mother and Oh there's nothing that whiskey won't so Yes I'm a whiskey for me there's a story to be told Over a shot of whiskey or food Now rest your soul now Thank you for all the glorious years And I'll dance my way till the morning light Now rest your soul, now mother and dear Oh, there's nothing I whiskey or won't so A shot of whiskey a story to be told Over a shot to whiskey or free To bed now, little one. Yeah, and get yourself ready for your dreams. Yeah, and I'll be up to tell you your story. Now, run up to bed now. Local artist there, Tim Lay, with his track Whiskey, and you can find more of his songs and covers on SoundCloud by searching under Tim Lay, spelt L-E-A-Y. Earlier on, we heard Plimpton Cubs renewing their vows. Roy, an official from the Cub Scouts who organised the event, explained the significance of its timing to reporter Charlotte Willis. We have celebrated 100 years of scouting tonight at a precise time of uh, 1916, which corresponds with the year uh, 100 years ago as we didn't know exactly what time Hayden Poe actually ran the first Cub group. So that's what we've done tonight, really. Excellent. And we're joined here by Spencer. Spencer, can you tell us why you joined the Cub Beavers? Uh, it's because I don't really like staying inside and my dad was a leader and I started when I was about three years old. Would you recommend children your age and above to join? Yes. Brilliant. For something to do, I take it, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, and have you been on activities and things with the Cub Beavers? Yes. Uh, what sort of activities have you been on? I've been to the Cub Camps, the quiz I've done. Competitions, we've had comp- yeah. We have a competition. Competitions, we? yeah. We have a quiz. Great, thank you, that's excellent. So if anyone wants to join, then they want to take the little voice of Spencer there. Yeah. Thank you for your time, Spencer, OK? And thanks a lot, Roy, for your interview there. It was really interesting. And can you also tell us, um, basically, if they wish to get in contact with you, how do they do so? If anybody wanted to uh, join any of the Plimpton packs, they you know, could ring me and I would put them onto the correct pack, if you know. My number is 01752 335424. 
Plimpton has been identified as being a high-risk area for contracting the flu due to the low take-up of the flu vaccination. Paula Vondel Dawes from Beacon Medical explained the problem to me. Yeah, so we, we've been running a flu campaign. You, some of them, your readers and listeners may have seen some of the posters across Plimpton. Um, so we've done it right across the Beacon populations, including Ivy Bridge and Chadwood. And we've we've been looking at the figures recently, and we're very aware that Plimpton patients are still at risk of the flu virus um, we've been, had a very mild winter up until now and we know that people have perhaps um, not appreciated the, the the sort of the significance of the flu coming um, but it is and we know that because the use of antivirals um, has been increasing and we know that patients are beginning to get get the flu so when we look at the numbers there's about 1300 patients across Plimpton that are still very vulnerable they're patients with a long-term condition um, incidentally um, they're patients that uh, fit into that that category that they, they could get the flu vaccine for free of charge so we're saying sign up for the the practice practice clinics that are being made available from January don't be a victim of flu because it's not just about you it's about your family your carers the people that interact with you once you've got it it spreads you know it's 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 a horrible horrible thing to have so there's another flu clinic um, coming um, in January so please sign up for it get vaccinated protect yourself your family and your your friends I must admit when I think of the flu vaccine you think well it's sort of November time you, you get that I'm surprised perhaps it's still going on uh, in January, so it's still a benefit of getting vaccinated uh, uh, that late on. Absolutely. So the flu, um, the flu period, if you like, runs from sort of as you say, in October, November, right the way through to March. And we're asking people to really think, think seriously about getting the flu vaccine because Plymouth, Plimpton, sorry, at the moment is looks like it's exposed, and that's that's dangerous for the whole community. Well, why do you think that Plimpton has been so reticent to get itself vaccinated? Um, I think you know it's been such a mild winter. Um, people are perhaps uh, there's, there's anecdotal information around people being fr- frightened that it will, the, the actual vaccine will make them feel poorly. Um, that's not the case. It's it's about being protected early or as early as possible. Um, but we've had such a mild winter. I think you know we've all become a little bit complacent. It's not going to hit. But we're seeing now that patients are coming to practice. They've got the flu. They're passing it on, and people are becoming very vulnerable to it. Is there a particular type of person who would specifically benefit from having the flu vaccine so obviously if you have a long-term condition you should definitely go to your your gp um patients that uh, fit into you know if they're over 65 um but we're also very aware that there's patients um who are vulnerable as i say with a long-term condition between um uh, 18 and uh and 65 as well so if you think you fit into that category and obviously very young children and pregnant women as well so if you if you in if you're in any of those categories please come and get your flu vaccine and um, look out for the posters you know explain everything and look out for the the um, new flu clinics that are being running post christmas time as well okay over what period of time do you envisage that those clinics will go on so you can come to the practice at any time and get your flu jab um, but we're looking to put on a, a clinic um, at the end of January um, and it will be at the Plimpton practice. Okay, and uh, you obviously cover three uh, areas, including Ivy Bridge and, uh, and Chadwell. I think you've also got one at, uh, uh, at Water. So, do, do all those people have to come into Plimpton, or could they? No, have it they, in can, there? they can. They can all get their flu jabs at their local practice as well. Um, we have been running flu clinics at the Watermark in Ivy Bridge. They've been really successful. They've been off site from the GP practice, so we, we're very aware that we need to do something similar in I, in Plimpton. And we're actually looking at the moment to see if we can identify location in perhaps in the the, the town centre where that might be easy for people to come but we'll, we'll make that absolutely public as soon as we've got a location but if you are in need of a flu vaccine right now and you fall into any of those categories I've mentioned please come to the practice and get the get the flu jab um, as soon as possible. Okay well we hope that uh, people will take up that uh, offer and uh, thanks for making that appeal. Thank you very much indeed. And alas, that's it for this first edition of 2017. I'll leave you this month with the sound of the Plimpton St. Marth Church bells, playing just before the start of their Christmas Eve midnight mass service a few weeks ago. 